Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Donna Blanchard. And I'm Justine Spiritu. Kumukuhua Theater, right down Merchant Street from Think Tech, has had some great local plays, but this month is special. Yes, this month, Kumukuhua is presenting a revival of the play Kailani, originally written by Dennis Carroll, Victoria Nalani Nubel, Robert Nelson, and Ryan Page. It was entirely collaborative. Victoria and Ryan were graduate students at UH. Dennis was their playwriting teacher and mentor. Bob wrote a libretto for an operetta about Kailani. Dennis had the idea of turning it into a cantata for the theater. And they each wrote different scenes. Dennis put it together and took it into rehearsal. And so the play was born. It's the touching story of the short life of Princess Kailani, set against the tragic backdrop of the downfall of the Hawaiian monarchy. How she was sent to Europe to get an education for a queen and how she came back to a Hawaii that had lost its throne. The play turned out to be a musical drama, complete with a Hawaiian Greek chorus and chanter. It places the princess in the events of the times during three different phases of her life, and in doing so, gives us new perspective. Kaiolani premiered at Kumakuhua in 1987, nearly 30 years ago, and toured twice, including the neighbor islands and Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., and Edinburgh, Scotland. It has been well-traveled and well-received. Audiences have been moved and, in fact, startled by the production. It's the kind of play that can restore your interest in theater. Beautiful to watch with cultural and historic depth, dance, music, poetry, and imaginative stagecraft. So Think Tech took a walk to Kumakahua down the block to see the play in rehearsal. First, Donna gave us an overview of the production outside the theater. Then we talked with Harry Wong, the director of the revival, the actor who portrayed Queen Lili Ukalani, and the actors who portray the Princess Kailani and her father Archibald Cleghorn as she was growing up. In our visit, we found a play of powerful drama and relevance. It's a rather tragic story told in a very beautiful, poetic way with a Greek chorus and some incredible inventive direction from our artistic director here at Kumukuhua Theatre, Harry Wong. So let's go inside. Harry. Mm -hmm. What, can you tell us about your experience with this show, Kat Iolani? Uh, well, the first time I saw it was when uh, we were going to take it to the Edinburgh Theatre Festival in 1990. I was, um, they were going to take two shows. One was called The Conversion of Ka'au Manu, and the other one was Kat Iolani. And so I was AD for the production of uh, Ka'au Manu. And um, so then I got, to, I got to see the show, this show. And um, I had to tech the show, so I think I ran the slide projector that happens at the end. And uh, that was my first introduction to it. And then when I saw it, you know, I had never seen anything like it before. Yeah, the way that Dennis, Dennis Carroll, the original director, had imagined it was that there was a chorus of women which um, they held these poles, and the poles became different locations and different items on stage. They were basically, they became the set. Um, that kind of created the feelings for each scene and everything. What's the history of the production of the show? It went to Edinburgh, where else? Uh, I, it also toured the Outer Islands back in, I think it was like either 88 or 89. It, no, yeah, I guess it was 88. It toured the Outer Islands. Um, the theaters all used to get a little bit more money from the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. And uh, because uh, Kumukuhu is located on Oahu, but because we were getting money from the state foundation, they felt it was important that um, all the people who paid taxes get to see the, the, what they were supporting, basically. And so they toured it to the neighbor islands, including Waianae and um, the Windward side. Oh, okay. And it was performed there, too. And, uh, the same, and then the more, I guess, they played it on the outer skirts of Honolulu, um, the reactions would be different. You know, like there would be, there are, people would treat it historically as something they would be coming to learn, maybe historically, and other people got wrapped up in the emotions of, of um, I guess, their lost monarchy. She is probably the first Hawaiian to receive um, a cosmopolitan kind of um, education. And then for lack of a better word, that's what most of the Hawaiians here now experience in the sense that they go to public school uh, for the United States of America, and of course we're a state. But um, so it's this tension that she has between um, 
being Hawaiian, being like native to this land, and then also the benefit of being able to see it from the other perspective. And I think ultimately, because, because she was like one of the first, it kind of, um, it kind of deadened her in a way. I believe that um, when, you, when you go into the future without an understanding of the past, it's like walking into a room without a flashlight. You know, it's, it's, it's the past that lights the way to the future. And I think um, any production that deals with the past, that's the goal. You know, I mean, uh, I believe, um, you know, like they say, oh, you're condemned to relive the past if you don't remember it. I think it's more than that. I think that um, it actually makes going into the future possible in a way. And I think that a reminder that there was a time in which there, it could have gone either way in, Hawaii, in Hawaii's history. It could have become, you know, not on the path to becoming part of the United States, but staying like an independent country. That moment, I think, you know, within some people's, well, not that many people's lifetime anymore. But um, coming back to remember that moment will light, you know, the future. The new constitution will differ from the Bayonet Constitution of 1887 in the following particulars. Article 49, the queen shall sign and approve all bills and resolutions, even those which are voted when passed over her veto. Article 57, the queen shall appoint the nobles and they shall hold their appointments for life. Article 62, only subjects shall vote. Article 65, appointments of Supreme Court judges will not be for life as before, but for six years only. The most recent thing I did at Kumukahua was waiting for a king in Kaluai Ko'olau, I think 2010. Okay. Um, before that I did Kamau, Masikaha Hawaii, but those have been quite a few years. Quite a few years yeah. ago. What made you want to come back to do this show? Well, you know, actually, I didn't know that this show was coming up until I was contacted by Harry, and we were chatting about what was coming up. And I was immediately excited about the prospect of Ka'iulani and the story of that whole time period being portrayed. And I worked with Harry before, and I knew that it was very choral and very um, physical in the script, just it's musical and physical and emotional and poetic and I loved the possibility of that convergence. Is it important to you that you do work that is relevant to the Hawaiian community? It is and I, I so often do it instinctively I think that I don't intellectually make those choices but I think it's just natural. It's, it's the culture that we are trying to live every day that's a part of our our worldview and the way we interact. And so if that just segues into theater, all the better for me. It's just, it's just a natural extension of what I'm trying to do all the time, professionally and personally anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can tell stories that are sometimes hard for people to hear. Yes. In such a way that they, yes. they can digest. And those are the moments where I think the conventions of multiple genres of theater, multiple cultural theatrical forms become very, very useful because people are already, I think, sometimes primed to, to close off from difficult material or to find it hard to digest because it's large in volume, a lot of dates and names. And so when you can enter through emotional channels or aesthetic channels that they want to engage in, then they're already in a better situation to receive content that maybe can be challenging, yeah. can be hard. So when you're talking with your family and friends and telling them to come see the show, and I'm assuming you are telling them all to come see the show. I am, don't you worry. Good. How do you <laughs> describe it to them? To the people I'm mostly talking to, they have the historical awareness of, if I say Ka'iulani, if I say that time period, they have a lot of knowledge already in that area. So I don't have to do too much to expand upon even what time period we're talking about or who those people are. But I try to, to share with them some of the unique qualities of this particular script, this unique approach, because I think people, when they know the history of this individual and all these individuals and the historic and you know, the political events that we know so well, they're just kind of imprinted in our minds. 
we often think, okay, so it's going to be exactly what I know from that moment of annexation, and it'll be literally and very realistically portrayed. So what I try to share with them is that the approach of these playwrights and the approach of this director and the approach of this cast is to expand what we know historically actually happened into hyperreal and surreal and otherworldly moments then maybe we'll give us a little bit of, I mean, maybe a little bit of insight into those moments that we think we know because we took the history class or we read the book, but this is another approach to maybe expand our understanding. To be able to bring the years and years of hula and Hawaiian cultural, I guess training is one word, but experience and just living through all of that, to be able to bring that to a piece like this and to a different space has always been really rewarding. It's home, so many years away, now home with close again. I could sleep whole again, for we were all the same now, the people that I loved, Hawaiians, together, and there was still the hope that annexation would never happen. How do you describe this play when you're talking to your family and friends about it? Um, well, I do let them know that it is done in three parts and that the, the character Ka'iolani is played by four different actresses because I, I feel like credit should be given to all four of us. Um, and hearing about her life too, it, it is appropriate that, that four people do help tell her story because it is a very big story to tell. A lot happened, and um, I do kind of give them the heads up. It is a little sad, but it's, it's also beautiful in the sense that um, I guess people who don't really know about the Hawaiian culture or the Hawaiian history, what happened leading up to the overthrow and um, after the overthrow, it's, it's a great show to see. The story itself is, is deeply tragic. But the way in which it, it's done, don't you think the, the art of it is uplifting? It is. Um, from a personal level, I, I have to say, being a part of this production, it kind of resonated. Um, in, I went to Kamehameha schools, and I didn't really get involved with the Hawaiian culture. I, I kind of went um, the performing arts route of it, where I was in marching band. I didn't take Hawaiian. I took Japanese. And it, it's... It's kind of, it kind of encourages you to learn about your Hawaiian culture um, or not, not even being Hawaiian. I, I think it would inspire people. Speaking as the third, knowing what I know, I want people to understand that she was just a woman. Um, she tried to do what she could for her people. And I think maybe deep down even she knew that it was already too late. But, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but there was just this big weight that was thrown on her. And it was almost kind of unfair because she wasn't given the opportunity to prove whether or not she could do it. Sorry, and I think that's, I think that's what's beautiful about this is even though she knew that the odds were against her, she was willing to try. Sorry. <laughs> And I think a lot of women can resonate with that, or that, that will resonate with them, where they will, you know, um, every day they wake up, every day they do the things that are expected of them, and they are not given the, the, um, the benefit of the doubt or the, you know, that they are just women. They're just like everybody else. I want people to think of her and think what more could they do for their culture. Um, it was beautiful, actually. Earlier today, Ryan Okinaka, our stage manager, he summed it up wonderfully. There's almost like this Hawaiian renaissance going on where, um, with all the immersion schools, he talked about how his nephews, they speak Hawaiian fluently, and he went to school for it, but there's still this lack between them. He'll never be able to converse with them the way that they can converse with each other. So I kind of hope that people can look at this um, and watch the performances and have it awaken something in them where they want to be more invested in their culture. I know that's what's happened for me. And I'll never get tired of the garden. We used to have a garden. 
in Scotland when I was a boy. Yes? I suppose that's why I'm so fond of them. Uh, of course, it was a very different kind of garden. Uh, the English, they have lovely gardens, some of them. So I've heard. They have a kind of a garden that's it's made into a maze. It's, it's like hedges that form paths, and one can wander around and around, and never know where one is exactly. How strange. It's quite amusing. I would like to see one. Well, perhaps soon you will. Oh, Papa, oh, Papa, are we going on a trip? Finally, no, uh, we... well, not exactly. You see, your uncle Kalakao and I have been talking for quite some time, and we feel that the time has come for you to go away to school. You want to send me away? Well, yeah, we've discussed it at some length, and in order to strengthen the ties, between our kingdoms, we've chosen England. England? In England, you would receive a European education and you would become cosmopolitan. England is too far. I don't want to leave Hawaii. Well, just a moment ago, you were excited about going on a trip. That was different. I thought it was a trip for pleasure. I thought you were coming. You'll see half the world. I do not want to go away to school. You must. Someday you will be queen. Do you think I will be? Yes, I do. Mama said I wouldn't. She was very sick when she said those things. She didn't know what she was saying. What if it's true? People can't see the future. That's just an old superstition. Is it, Papa? Of course. We have to live our lives according to what we know about today. After your Aunt Lilu, it's likely you will be queen. Aunt Lilu isn't sick, is she? No, darling, she's not sick. England, it's so far away. It's the king's wish. You're my father. It's my wish also. I do not want to. You must. You will be queen. I belong here. I'm sorry, VK. We've decided. I tell them that I'm playing the young Kaiolani in the play of Princess Kaiolani at Kumukuhua Theater. And it's very nice. It gives you an in look of what happened through Kaiolani's life. Yeah, the historical perspective. I don't like to tell them too much. I get choked up just thinking about the story. Because every time we're on stage, <clears throat> most of the people in here, by the time it's at the end, even the, the players in here are cheering up and... So actually, it's, I don't even like to tell it that much because it's, you know, it really hits home after seeing it done over and over in here. And I don't care how many times I've seen it, it's, it's very powerful. Well, I try to think of what would happen if it was happening to me. Like typically with the scene with my mom when she's dying, I try to imagine how would I feel if my mom was dying. Before, I wasn't that interested in it, but now I see that it's like a whole new life, just in a different time and era. Yeah, I feel like I've connected to them. Everyone is so into these scenes, uh, focused on them, and as I mentioned, you know, cheering up all the time when it gets serious, that it's not, it's not that hard to act in this, in this show. <laughs> Kailani is central in the tradition of kumukuhua and local theater. Hopefully it will continue to inspire young writers and directors to find the intersection of dramatic art and the history of the islands. We look forward to more writers and directors on the Hawaiian stage and more plays of this special quality. Hawaii has thousands of stories and this is just one of them that can be so well expressed on stage and in movies. The Descendants movie was a good example, but there are still thousands of stories left and Hawaii still has an enormous body of content to share with the world. Let's learn how to explore those stories as a resource for our writers and thus our future.
And now let's look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech has launched two new news shows. Our daily global ThinkTech news with me, Donna Blanchard, and our radar news with Sachi Slomov. Stay current with ThinkTech news. Check them out on ThinkTech Hawaii. More big news. ThinkTech is now live around the world, around the clock. We stream our talk shows live from 12 noon to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then stream our earlier shows through the night. Check us out anytime for great content and community on thinktechhawaii.com and on livestream.com. And for our archive on demand, check out youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links, or to join our email list and get these links and program advisories on our upcoming shows. We also invite you to be part of our live audience at our downtown studio in Pioneer Plaza. Contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. Raise your awareness in every way on ThinkTech. On May 21st, ThinkTech will present a program entitled Public Spaces in Paradise, How Can We Preserve Them? We'll discuss the importance of public spaces in Hawaii's traditional quality of life, their increasing importance in the face of increased construction, and what will happen if we don't preserve them. Join us for this important program. Let's take a look at community planning, and even better, let's be a part of it. You can sign up to attend this program on thinktechhawaii.com. And now here's this week's Think Tech Commentary. I'm Donna Blanchard and this is a Think Tech Commentary. I'd like to talk about social trends. We all know that millennials are constantly engaged with their smartphones and tablets. They tag, post, and like more than they make eye contact, shake hands, and do coffee. They and wretched social miscreants ranging through Y and all the way into the X generation have no idea how to carry on a civilized conversation, attend a social event, or have a meaningful one-on-one -on -one relationship with anyone other than their smartphones, right? Frankly, I'm sick to death of people who are worried that the future of our world is doomed because some of us text, snap, and pin for both communication and entertainment. It's different, that's all. We're all still accomplishing the same sharing of ideas, interests, affection, and society. We're just doing it in a different way, and we're doing it really fast. We read an article about the current state of Yemen, post it, tag our friends, and have a global conversation about it faster than our parents could get to the end of the driveway to pick up the paper. And it's all right. It's okay if you prefer your news via actual paper or online. It's fine if you subscribe or like to catch your news based on posts by people you follow. I rarely hear people in their 20s complaining about their elders who don't have Instagram accounts or won't use Waze instead of asking for directions or giving updates on their drive. Why is it that so many people over the age of 50 think it's okay to complain about others using technology to handle the architecture of personal social logistics? A Harvard Business Review article entitled Reassess Millennials, Social Sharing Habits pointed out that traditional research tells us that multitasking is impossible. People can only do two things at once if one of those things is routine. However, Nielsen NeuroFocus EEG readings suggest that younger brains now have higher multisensory processing capacity and are more stimulated, that is, more engaged with more likelihood of remembering by dynamic messages. Their brains are developing to integrate multiple streams of information. 
While baby boomers might see phones, tablets, and other devices as distractions, millennials use them to collaborate and innovate in real time. You may view social sharing as an unhealthy mix of personal and professional, but most millennials see it as a way to gather input and learn. They are evolving with our exponentially expanding digital world. Instead of judging their behavior harshly, you could, and maybe should, accept and appreciate it, and at the very least, consider leveraging it. I'm Donna Blanchard, and this has been a ThinkTech commentary. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Justine, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Jay Fidel does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. Definitely, Donna. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or volunteer, a producer or intern, and help us reach Hawaii. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech and for supporting tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Donna Blanchard. See you center stage. I'm Justina Spiritu. Aloha, everyone. Oh, oh.